Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, June 20th regular meeting of the school committee. I would invite those who are here in the studio to please rise if you'd like to join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic of the United one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. So just as we're starting, just want to point out for anyone who is watching from home that we have our chair, Mina Barath, is uh, participating remotely so that all of our votes we will do by roll call here. Uh, and at this point, uh, we have an opportunity for public comment. I don't know if there's anybody hiding back there, but um, seeing no one, we can move right into recognitions. So I just have one recognition, and I just wanted to thank the administrative team uh, for all of their work in the 1920 school year, uh, 1819 school year, <laughs> embarking on the 1920 school year. Uh, so the high school administration, um, led by Mr. Bishop, the middle school, led by Mr. Keller, Vanessa Bellello at Hopkins, Ann Carver at Elmwood, and Van uh, Lauren DeBoe at Marathon. So thank you to them for all the hard work this year. I think our kids got great experiences all around. So, yeah, a good year. Thank you, um, Dr. Kavanaugh, for calling that out. There is absolutely no doubt that the leadership of the administration makes a huge difference on the culture that we have in the schools and the experience that our students have. Um, I would also like to acknowledge both you and Ms. Parsons for a strong partnership in leading the district this year. Um, and the most notable for me being drawing out the strategic plan in your very first year it is quite a feat that you were able to reach out to so many people and continue the work seamlessly that was done uh, by the previous leadership in administration. So your work um, is admirable. Thank you. Thank you, Weena. No I have, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, Nancy. No, it's okay. I, just, I don't have video of you, so it's, I didn't mean to, I just can't see you. Go ahead. There's one other one that I want to call out is Sue McClure, um, who has been doing our minutes for years, and um, she has chosen to step out of that role. So I just want to recognize that having her help has meant a lot to us. She has always been so thoughtful and timely in her work. And I don't know if Jen wants to add something to it. She was the one working with her this past year. Absolutely. She, she has, she does such a I feel like a not I don't want to say thankless that's not the right word but I mean to just Behind sit and scenes. yeah exactly yeah. and just go through the meeting you know with a fine-tooth comb and and draft all the details of it is such a huge uh, weight lifted off of our shoulders for sure so I definitely wish her all the best I know she's got a lot on her plate so I hope um hope all goes well here and this is one last thing for her to worry about All right, then uh, we can move into uh, the superintendent's report. All right. Uh, so the superintendent's report really has just those sort of end of year items. Uh, the first one, uh, we have some statistics for the class of 2019, and I'll talk a little bit more about the ones in your packet. Uh, so you can see that 92% of the class of 2019, which is 260 students, went off to four-year colleges. Uh, less than 1%, so only one student went to a two-year college. One student went to a prep school. Uh, five students went off to full-time employment. Three students are doing a gap year before they go to college. One student um, is um, in a career ed program. Two students have gone into military service. And we had nine of our international students return home. So there's uh, just the breakup breakdown of that in numbers of students and in percentages. Uh, and the last statistic on that page is the average SAT scores. And you can see that those were calculated by using each graduate's highest evidence-based reading and writing score and the highest math score. So you may see another number in the documents that are inside the packet, but this is um, our, our students' highest iteration of uh, the best performance on the test. And Dr. Kavanaugh, can you tell us what the asterisk is for right after four-year college? Or am I seeing uh, things? No, no, yeah. You know what? I don't actually have that information because 
I when I I when I cut this out of the guidance report, I didn't okay. know what that is, so okay. I can get back okay. to you on that. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, some of the data that you have in your packet, you have the list of colleges that accepted Hopkinton High School applicants from the class of 2019, and you can see that that is quite a lengthy list. Lengthy. It's nice to see so many different colleges represented. It is really nice to see how many colleges are there, and you can, on the next page, you can, or in the next report, you can see the number of applications that went to all of those colleges, and I think that that's pretty interesting, uh, and they are in um, descending order, so, for example, UMass Amherst, 124 students in that class all applied to UMass Amherst, um, which I think is is kind of interesting and so you know as a guidance department you might sit and kind of contemplate why does that happen you know UMass has exceptionally great programs and probably comes at a good price uh, but some of the others are interesting why do we always have 48 kids or 40 kids applying to Boston College and Boston University mm. aside from the fact that Professor Tyler teaches at Boston University <laughs> Why. But that That's is why. Um, I think there's some lineage in town for BC too. Yes. I feel like that half the Hopkinton's population yes. graduated from BC. Sometimes that's how I feel. I feel like an outsider since I didn't graduate from BC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, and you know, to look at and, and I guess some of the other statistical data here that's interesting to me is, you know, we can have 20 kids who are applying to Dartmouth or 17 kids who are applying to Harvard, and this year. I think, and Mr. Bishop, you can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, but I think we had three students get into Dartmouth this year, uh, no one getting into Harvard this year. So, as you look at this, sometimes it's just really unpredictable as to where kids will go. You know, there's that sort of myth that says if Dartmouth takes one kid, they will only take one kid, but we have three. So, you know, it's just interesting data. Um, and this is really that 30,000 foot view kind of data. Uh, we also have information that comes out of the guidance department that will tell us you know, the each of the students' GPAs in descending order. So if the first student on the list has a GPA of 5.4321, um, it will tell you all of the colleges that that particular student applied to, and then it will tell you where he or she matriculated. Uh, we don't share that information publicly only because if you saw the name of the college, you would be able to very likely determine the student and then know what that student's GPA was. So um, just for confidentiality reasons, we don't share that information. And the last piece that you have in here are all of the test ranges. So you have information from the ACT and you have information from the plan test and the PSAT and the SAT and what this data will give you is the middle 50%. So what you're seeing there um, means that 25% performed above that range and 25% performed below that range. And then you get to see the mean for all of those. Um, and, you know, you can, one of the things that the colleges will do is that they will tell you what the uh, median 50% were in past years as kids applied. So the very nice part of that is that if you are thinking about applying to a particular school, you've kind of got a little bit of a framework to say, am I a logical candidate for that school or am I not? So I don't know if there's any questions about any of this, but. No questions, it was just interesting to look at. It's yeah. fun to see all the, like you said, it's cool to yeah. see all the different places kids are interested in applying to and all the ones are kind of interesting the the places that only received one application because they're so all over the place so it's good just shows our kids are doing lots of different things and, and looking for lots of and different things and there was things. a park who applied to Ken clemson university <laughs> which i found fascinating yeah, that's, I didn't what's know going that on <laughs> migration to the south the winters are so hard is that <laughs> But those are the kinds of questions that I have when I look at this data, yeah. right? And then it's interesting to see it year to year. Yeah. You know, if there's a spike at, you know, the University of Delaware, why? Right. Right. Yeah. Right. right. All right. Just a couple of additional pictures. We've got Flag Day over at Marathon at the bottom. You can see Mark and Nancy on their way out. They are this year's retirees, so they were the leaders of the parade. Uh, this is just a quick shot from the Hopkins School. Uh, Doug Scott's engineering students design a toy, and then they bring it over to Hopkins, and the students review uh, the toy and give the high school kids feedback. 
just a, a candid here. These are some uh, middle school kids. Assistant Superintendent Jen Parson and I went over on the next to last day of school and there was a lot of winding down, a little bit of connect four. <laughs> that particular student challenged me to a game and told me he would definitely beat me. So I declined. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't have the stamina to be beaten. That would be quite the bragging right, though, to say you beat the superintendent. It would have been. Oh my goodness. Uh, this is the departure at Marathon, I just thought. These pictures were really very sentimental for me. Uh, because you'll remember that we had the pictures of the kids at the beginning of the school year getting off the buses for the very first time. And the way this works is when the buses are all queued up, the kids kind of you know parade on past and get in the buses, but then the teachers on the last day all line up and wave to the students as they're leaving. It was a pretty misty experience. It was nice. Uh, this slide is kind of a fib. Uh, <laughs> on this slide, it said varsity baseball were going to be in the state finals tonight, and then they were rained out of tonight, and so then they were going to be there tomorrow night. Uh, but Mr. Bishop just informed me on his way in that the game has been moved to Saturday at noon. So, for anyone exciting. interested in you, it is exciting. Yeah, uh, this is our, our third team to go to a state championship this year. It's pretty amazing. Now, are the seniors able to participate in that even? Okay, let's see. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. So these are the uh, enrollment data from June 6th that I had presented to you two weeks ago. I know it's very small on that screen, and I think the more important slide is the next one where you can see how many more have been approved. So for example, in grade two, the previous slide would have said that we had five students who had been approved and uh, now it says eight. So you can see the pluses. In grade two, there are three more than last time. Grade four, three more than last time. Grade five, one more than last time. Grade six, two more than last time. Grade seven, increased by one. Grade eight, increased by four. Grade nine, increased by three grade 10 by one and grade 11 by one. And you're starting to see uh, big pockets of kids at grades two, four, and obviously nine again. Um, so, and you know, grade six is also at, at, uh, at five. So the numbers are, are growing. Um, that means that we've had 19 additional students since June 6th. Uh, one thing that, you, probably not seeing on here uh, is that you know you'll have a couple of kids who will unenroll in the Hopkinton Public Schools along mm -hmm. the way too. Uh, so when we look at the total enrollment at 3,866 that's everybody right now that includes Keefe Tech, it includes Norfolk Aggie, it includes anybody who is outside the district. Uh, so we'll have a, a more accurate number of how many kids are at each grade level as we work through the summer. K enrollment now has hit 259, which I believe is one student greater than what NESDEC predicted. Their prediction was 258. So that could be climbing. Last year we thought we were going to have 204 students at the start of school, and we had 264 students in kindergarten. So we'll have to see where those numbers go. And am I right? It, it felt like there was a big surge kind of in the July, early August time period. Even if people, you know, people do funny things, even if they buy a home and they move in on, you know, the 8th of July, sometimes they just don't get around to getting into power school and doing their enrollment till say, August 1st, right? It just doesn't seem to be, you know, pending. Uh, something right. that's really important for them, so, yeah, that can happen. So what is the classroom average right now, the number of kids in each class with this number coming in? So I think if we look at kindergarten, they're probably at like 20. Okay. You know? And last year we had that issue of we thought we were going to have very low class sizes, you know, 17, mm -hmm. 18, and we ended up pushing that up over 20 because of the number of kids who had come in. Um, and we, what we had decided to do at that time was to add paras rather than to add a classroom. So we've already planned for an additional classroom this year. I'm just hoping that, you know, the numbers are stable enough to sustain. Okay. Hmm. And that's all we've got. All right. Thank, thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. Um, and I just want to uh, piggyback on the comment that Meg made 
about the classroom sizes, especially for the younger grades. Um, I'm grateful that you're thinking of, uh, you know, you're planning ahead. And last year, too, to your point, that was the expectation. But obviously, as the classroom sizes increase, especially in younger grades, it's, uh, you know, the, the student experience can vary greatly. I mean, you know that better than anyone else. So thank you for uh, planning ahead and thinking of adding an additional classroom. Yes. Well, you know, I guess if there were places that we, you know, are seeing numbers that are a little bit higher, it might be at Hopkins right now. But we'll, we'll be vigilant. Thank you very much. So that moves us into the school committee chair report. And in Mina's absence, I did approve the payroll warrants. Uh, I, I approved payroll warrant S19025 and S1925A. And the payroll warrants have been included in your packets. I also approved warrants 19-102 and 19-103. All of them are included in your packet. And I don't know, Mina, did you have anything else you wanted to add as the school committee chair report? Um, sure. I, I just wanted to um, acknowledge the fact that uh, I have been in touch with both you, Nancy, mm -hmm. and Dr. Cavanaugh in the past couple of years. And I'm very thankful, especially to you, Nancy, for you know the small nuances of uh, you know the day-to-day -day work as chair. So that's been very helpful to have that support uh, from you. Um, also, I want to share that I've been in touch with uh, Dorothy Presser at MSC mm -hmm. as we are planning uh, for the upcoming session on uh, self-assessment by the entire school committee and thinking of how we can um, have some training sessions throughout the year, a desire that uh, the school committee had expressed that we should perhaps partner uh, more with MSA and look for some training. So that's what I have. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone have any liaison reports? I've, I have a policy, which we're talking about later on anyway, so I can kind of, um, um, when we get to those, I can be a little, little bit more specific. But, um, just to mention one thing that's not on our agenda is we did speak about um, the bullying prevention plan um, and one of the things um, that we I guess don't want to say uncovered is just it, basically the bullying prevention plan um, was reviewed by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education back in February and they looked at all sorts of things including special education, EL instruction, civil rights, or bullying policy um, they suggested some minor changes that were integrated into the plan. Um, the only thing is that plan is not currently on our website because of the website changeover. So once that changeover happens, the updated version is going to be on our website. So, um, but, but essentially, Desi looked at our stuff, said this is good, so we're good to go. Um, the other th quickly as a report I have is I went to the policy meeting the other day because on their agenda there was something about um, the busing situation at Legacy Farms. They didn't get to that on the agenda when I was at the meeting. However, um, it, just to let you everyone know that it's something that they're talking about, I think they did a, a, a site walk over there. And um, so anyway, I don't know. You know, I know the discussion has started here and then it's moved over to Legacy Farms. I don't know if... The plan is to bring it back here, but um, I'm, you know, when I have more information, I'll make that available. Thank you. That's it. That's all I got. So I just had a quick one on the bridge. Uh, Dawn Ronan and I met with the uh, people from Project Just Because, and were able to work out some things to help get some resources for all kinds of different things, in addition to snacks and supplies for students that we're going to have the buildings identify what they're in need of, uh, and then we're going to start moving into looking at some of the policies and procedures as we move into the fall. So, Great. but probably a little quieter over the summer. That's it for me. So, I, um, I have one thing on behalf of uh, Amanda, um, and this is more around uh, the website <coughs> subcommittee. And, uh, you know, I know that Mr. Ghosh is going to be presenting later in the meeting um, some of the work that has been done, uh, which seems very exciting. Um, so the request that uh, that has come from Amanda is related to the membership of the uh, of the subcommittee. She expressed that it's been challenging, um, you know, getting a quorum for the meetings for folks to attend the meeting. So she was actually looking to see if the school committee would consider reducing the membership by three 
And the three specific numbers are coming because there are three members who have not been able to engage uh, as much as uh, they would have liked, two of whom are high school students who recently mm -hmm. graduated. So you can understand uh, where, where they're coming from, especially with some of the work that's coming up. She was looking to reduce the subcommittee size, I believe, from 18 to 15, especially in this upcoming crucial phase. So I was, I was wondering if we could actually have a, a motion to uh, approve reduction of the um, membership coming from Ms. Fagiano, who's the chair of the website subcommittee. So since it's not on the agenda, I wonder if we would be better off putting it off until next week, because since we're meeting next week as well. So it, rather than take a vote on it. And have we alerted any of those members that we are removing them? Has there been any communication to them? I, I, um, I, I think Mr. Ghosh is also here. I don't know if he's aware of it. Yeah, um, I'm assuming the two high school students, I could easily email them just as a follow-up. But I'm assuming since they've graduated and are no longer available that they're probably aware. So the, the two high school students, I'm not sure who the third is. And then we also have a staff member who's who's done for the year and is moving away. So she is not gonna be on that as well. So it's at least three that would be off the committee. Um, so I'm assuming those three know that they're they're gonna be off, but I'm happy to re-email them. Is the committee meeting between now and uh, next Friday? Our hope is to meet on July 1st. Um, to so if, if we wait to vote on this next, next Friday, do we, just because it's not posted on, in our agenda, that's not going to cause a hardship for the committee? I don't think so. That will then allow us to have the right numbers for the July 1st meeting to vote on the approval of the district site. So as long as I think it's done by then, that would be helpful. Th that would be my comfort level, but I would like to hear from Mina. And yeah, Nancy, I guess, you know, we have that posted as a special, we're looking to add that as a special meeting, right? Yes. And that was the only thing. And if you think that it's okay to just add one line item, which is more a business item, mm -hmm. um, and if Dr. Kavanaugh is also okay with it, we can quickly add that, do a vote, it, it doesn't hurt. And some of these questions around notification can be addressed as well. I do feel like if it's something that you're taking a vote on, it might make better sense to post it first. I mean, even if there's a logical reason why the high school kids and someone moving away would be going off of the committee, it just feels it might be better to alert them to the fact that they're not on the committee anymore before we just sort of move them off. All right, that yeah, would be my let's do it then. Yeah. yeah, we'll put it on the agenda for, for uh, Friday. Friday. Friday, yeah. Yep, yeah, sounds good. Okay, then that moves us into new business uh, A, which is school counselor position for FY20, and that is for you, Mr. Bishop. Your summer's off to That's a good start. You too. Yes, you know, it is. So far, so good. Day one. <laughs> it's a good feeling on day one. It, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm here actually for, for two requests and, and looking for your support. The first is on a school counselor position, uh, and the second is on moving the graduation date. Uh, both conversations we've had before. Mm -hmm. uh, I came back uh, during the uh, FY20 budget cycle, I believe it was in December, and talked about our need for a school counselor position. Um, and you just look at the numbers that Dr. Kavanaugh just presented, they continue to uh, increase at the high school and in, all, in, in, in every building really in the district. Um, and we talk a lot about, and you've heard me talk about social emotional learning and, and the well-being of our students and that's a focus of ours and has been for a number of years. And obviously the work that we do at the high school is always trying to prepare students for life after high school. And I think when you think of a school counselor position, there's no position that's more important to those two components. So um, right now we have uh, six guidance counselors, or school counselors, um, and our ratios are around 218 to 1, and that actually is a little bit higher. We've had a few students uh, actually just register to come in, so it's literally probably around 220 to 1. Um, and then you're adding in that large incoming ninth grade. So if you remember the slide that was just put up there, the two biggest classes in the district are the ninth grade class and the 11th grade class next year. 
So our caseloads are probably going to be closer to 225, 230 to 1. Now, when I started as a guidance counselor here back in 2006, our numbers were about 180 to 1. And that was a manageable number, uh, especially trying to build relationships, getting students ready for that post-secondary decision, whatever it might be, writing recommendations, working on their schedules, teaching guidance seminars. There's so many components to the role of a school counselor. So, um, in right now, that number is really, really high when you compare it to other local high schools' numbers of, of, of counselors to students ratio. So if we were able to add another position, the numbers would be closer to 200 to 1, maybe even a little bit lower, which I think is ideal for a school of our size and for the demand of our school and the expectations that the community has. So we were able to, um, or hoping to reallocate 0.4 of our existing FTE towards this position. So what we're really looking for is your support with the additional 0.6 and trying to find funding. Maybe it comes out of the Legacy Farms money, um, but that's what I'm here to kind of talk about, to try mm -hmm. to be able to take, we can carve out 0.4 of what we've already asked for, and looking for an additional 0.6 to make a 1.0 position to add a seventh school counselor for next year. So I know you've heard me talk about this before, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about the position, about the structure of how it would work, um, anything that's, that's on your mind. So that was the only question I had for Dr. Kavanaugh was, mm -hmm. you know, this sounds like a Legacy Farms funds position mm -hmm. to me. I mean, we have an extra, you know, how 50 kids per guidance counselor added since you were a guidance yep. counselor here. Yep. Yep. It needs to happen. So mm -hmm. I f and I don't you could speak to your answer. I don't want to take away what you or take from what you said. No, we had looked at um, the numbers in Mandarin this year, and they are down a little bit from last year. So we have someone who works at 0.4, and that position would be reduced to 0.2. Yeah. So that 0.2 of that person's salary would be part of it. Uh, Mr. Bishop had asked for um, personnel, teachers, FTEs, and there's a 0.2 right now that would, that is sort of not earmarked anywhere. So the other 0.2 would go into this um, guidance counselor position. And when he'd asked for those positions, they were really sort of tentative. Mm -hmm. You know, we because at the high school level you have a student-generated schedule, uh, you have that opportunity to say, you know, we need eight sections of math, seven sections of math. It all depends on how many students you have enrolling. So he's got that point too. And what we're really looking for is your approval to take point six of an FTE from the Legacy Farms two hundred thousand dollars that has been appropriated at town meeting. Great. Yep. I move to approve that. Yeah, I'll second that. I think okay. it makes perfect sense. Yes. Yeah. Right. And then we'll do a roll call vote. So Mary. Yes. Hi. Jen. Yes. I am a yes. Mina. Yes. Okay. So it's unanimous. And Great. Thank you so much for yeah, the support. Sure. Really appreciate it. That's Absolutely. wonderful. Um, and the second request is is similar. I think we had this conversation maybe around this time last year. Um, we we set the graduation date. We typically have done it on the first Friday of June, but. Um, it is kind of late this year. I think it was June 7th, and then we moved it up to May 31st. And this upcoming school year, it's going to be on June 5th. And we're requesting to move it up to May 29th. And there's a few different reasons for it. Um, right now, if we were to keep the graduation date at June 5th, um, that would come right up to almost when the underclassmen start to take their exams. They take the exams the following Wednesday, so they'd only be about a two-day buffer zone. And usually, we have at least a week to two weeks of kind of a, a time frame where there's just the underclassmen in the building. Um, seniors have to be in school 168 days, and the 168 day happens to be May 29th, so that works out. Um, it also allows us to run our senior project the same way, which is usually a four to four and a half week process. If we had it on June 5th or kept it there, it would be a five and a half week process, which is a little bit longer than we've, we've done in the past. Um, and I, I think I included a few area schools. I did do some research, and, and many of the schools around us uh, are also graduating in that weekend, whether it's the Friday the 29th or Sunday the 31st, but typically around that time frame. So uh, it worked out great this past year, uh, so we're, we're hoping to, um, to move it up. And then as we get ready to do the calendar for the following year, I'll make sure that I come and, and, and talk about this earlier so we don't have to do it in the summertime. <laughs> It's a year from now. If you have to change it, you got to change it, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's big and the other thing I think I, I do want to mention, sorry, is that there are a lot of senior week activities that go along with graduation. So we have done our work on the back end. We've talked to Gillette Stadium about the dinner dance with the parents. That can be moved a week earlier. A boat cruise can be moved a week earlier. Uh, and then there's a Red Sox game also a week earlier. So it's all going to line up the way that it did this past year. So Nice. Perfect. So I move to approve the date change. All right. I second that. OK, we'll do a roll call vote. Meg? Aye. Jen? Yes. I am a yes. Mina? Yes. OK. 
Thank you. So it's unanimous. Thank All you right. very much. Thank you so much. And happy Sunday. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, you too. Thank you so much Put for the support, shorts. as always. Yeah. Oh, right? <laughs> Next no. time. I put away all the jackets. Yeah. I yeah. take it out. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank Have you. A thank Have you. a nice evening. You too. So that moves us into the final overnight approval of the field hockey trip, and that's you, Dr. Kavanaugh. Sure. It may have just been two weeks ago that we, we had this on our agenda. So you know that it has to be approved you know, prior to them going, and this would be the request for a final approval. Um, and again, it's the girls' varsity field hockey team, and they are going to Dennis Yarmouth High, Yarmouth High School. Uh, they have a tournament there. It's just... Um, and overnight, they leave on Friday, September 6th, and come back on Saturday, September 7th. So that's what we're looking for. Okay. Is there a motion to approve it? I move to approve it. I'll second it. OK. I'll do a roll call, Meg. Aye. Jen? Yes. I am a yes. Mina? Aye. OK. So that is unanimous and also passes. That moves us into the marathon gift account. Also you, Dr. Kavanaugh. All right, so as you know, all of these gifts need to be approved um, by the school committee. So this one is for the Marathon Elementary School. The amount of $1,723.14 was given to them as a gift from the HPTA. And we are just looking for your approval. I move to approve. I second. I have to accept something like that. That's right. right. Yeah. All right, a roll call. Meg? Aye. Jen? Yes. I am a yes. Mina? Yes. Okay, unanimous and awesome passes. That moves us into another Marathon School gift account. All right, so this one is from um, the trustees of the school fund, and it's in the amount of $3,500 for Marathon. And what they are going to be doing with that is they are going to be getting sensory tables for um, for kindergarten, I believe, and the hope there is that it will promote development of fine motor cognitive and language skills while nurturing social and emotional development. So I think that this is sort of a lovely gift. Fantastic. I move to accept this gift. I second. Roll call. Meg? Aye. Jen? Yes. I am a yes. Mina? Yes. Okay, unanimous and also passes. That moves us into the 2019 Winslow Coin it, my eyes are failing me. The Excellence in Education Award. And that's you, Dr. Pat. Yes, so I think I had mentioned in a superintendent's report some time ago that Principal Vanessa Bellello at the Hopkins School uh, had won an award, $2,000 of which would go to the school, and $1,750 would be for her personally. And she is taking her money and donating it also to the school. So what we are looking for is a motion for you to approve those two different dollar amounts, uh, $2,000 that would go directly and $1,750 that would go from Vanessa to the school to be put in the Hopkins gift account. Congratulations to Vanessa Bellello. What a wonderful honor. Um, and I move to accept this. Absolutely. I will second um, that. Oh, sorry. If I may just add a few things. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was lovely to see the note. And from the very first time I have seen Mrs. Bellello, her enthusiasm and her passion is palpable uh, for the students at Hopkins. And she's always been a great advocate uh, for the school. And clearly, she's been working to lay out programs. And uh, you know, it was interesting to read a little bit about CARES for which she was recognized. And I would hope that we can, um, in an upcoming report, hear a little bit more and what difference it has made to students. Um, so congratulations to Mrs. Bilalo. And uh, yes, uh, thanks to her for giving this back to the school. It's amazing. Agreed. Yeah. So we'll do a roll call then. Sorry, you, Meg? Yes. Jen, yes. I am a yes. Mina? Yes. Okay. So it is unanimous. and it so passes and that brings us into item g which is the lease of apple computer equipment for the one-to-one -one laptop program and that is mr ghosh thank you um, each year of the one-to-one -one laptop program it's necessary to initiate a new three-year lease uh, for macbook uh, airs uh, for the incoming ninth graders uh, to procure the equipment we've developed the detailed specifications and advertised the bid as required by massachusetts procurement laws Based on family applications, vendors were informed that we would need approximately 205 units um, with the final numbers to be determined uh, at a later date. Uh, the hardware specific uh, specifications are listed in the memo, but it's for a MacBook Air 13-inch screen um, with an 8th 
generation Intel Core i5, 256 gigabyte storage, and the most up-to-date specs that the Mac is offering. Um, as in years past, when the deadline for the bid submission arrived, we received only one bid at this point, and it was from Apple uh, Computer. Uh, the total lease payments for this bid would be $278,854. Um, the funding will come from the one-to-one -one, uh, laptop account, uh, which is a revolving account, uh, which is funded by students and families. Uh, the cost for the students are approximately $1,610. Uh, as with previous years, lease part participants can purchase the laptops at the end of agreement for a dollar plus tax. Uh, I recommend the school committee approve the bid received from Apple uh, computers for MacBooks as detailed above. We're happy to enter, entertain questions if you have about the lease or the, the payments. Can I ask just one question? How much does a MacBook Air 13 go for? So this is education funding. So this pricing yeah. here, and I'll just give an overview because there's some questions, and I believe Amanda had some questions about this, and I talked to the Apple rep today. So. Legally, they can't publish or post a bid that's below state contract pricing uh, because they would be in violation. I'm not a contract lawyer, so I can't speak on that, but they can't publicly put on paper a price that's lower than what they're allowed to do based on contract price. So the numbers you see here are roughly the education pricing, which is roughly $50 off of normal retail pricing. That being said, they will be working with us when they do the final lease paperwork and payment amount to get us a deeper discount as they usually do which usually ends up being around you know a hundred dollars off for more per device so that's what we usually end up with uh, at that point we typically revise the lease payments notify parents uh, of the updated amounts and um, make changes that need be but at a minimum parents have agreed to pay this amount and have signed paperwork for for this amount and this is the amount they've seen so far and i think as amanda asked last year there's some kind of support for families who can't put down 1600 over the course of three years correct so there's three ways to participate in the program and this is just one of them so okay. one is leasing to own um, through this program uh, another is just to bring your own device that you have from home which could be a laptop, it even could be a Chromebook or other similar device. It doesn't have to be uh, a Mac or Apple-based product. Uh, or the third way is to uh, utilize a machine, uh, a MacBook from the school. So the school maintains a loaner okay. pool of similar devices with access to similar software uh, and equipment that they have on a daily basis. They take it home with them. It's, it's theirs for the year. And even if the summer, if they're involved in special programming or summer school and they need that device, they can have that device throughout the summer. That's, so that's the third option. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Comments? Okay. So I move to approve the lease of the Apple computer equipment. I'll second. Okay, a roll call, Meg. Aye. Jen? Yes. I am yes. And Nina? Yes. That is unanimous and carries, and that moves us into item H, which is the lease of Apple equipment. Uh, the next lease is uh, basically FY20's budget includes funding to initiate a new three-year lease. Um, it's a fair market lease for various Apple computer products uh, at some computers and some um, accessories and parts as needed for the district. Uh, to procure this equipment, we developed uh, detailed specifications and advertised the bid as required by Mass Massachusetts procurement laws. Uh, when the deadline for the bid submission arrived, we received one bid as follows, Apple uh, Inc. Total lease payments was $2,026 and $578. Um, I recommend the school committee approve the bid received from Apple Inc. for the computer's equipment as detailed in the bid specifications. All funding will come from the school department's technology budget. Um, I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, Ashok, I was just wondering, looking at the memo, is there any reason why some of the detail of the equipment, the hardware that's being sought, which was listed out for this one-to-one -one program, uh, similar to that, was not listed um, in this particular memo? Um, there, there was no particular reason to, to do that. I can speak with Susan and kind of ask if there was a specific reason for that. I'm happy to kind of hi highlight some of the equipment. Um, the, the, the largest portion of this lease is for um, 
the normal replacement cycle for um, middle school staff. So uh, this uh, lease will fund roughly 105 laptop computers uh, for middle school teachers. Um, this is on the normal four-year schedule that we have to replace uh, teacher equipment. So that's a, a large portion, or roughly 150,000 of this of this lease is going towards that purchase, uh, roughly 50,000 a year over three years. The additional equipment would be um, some equipment for my technical staff. For example, one iMac computer, which is a uh, used for diagnostics in the repair centers, uh, smaller cables and spare charging cables a few Apple TVs, uh, and then the other bigger portion of this lease would be for uh, replacement iPads for uh, schools across the district. And this covers uh, a variety of purposes. Some is just replacing old iPads that no longer can be upgraded. Some of it is for growth. Uh, and I think Amanda asked some questions. I think out of all the iPads we're getting, about 25% of those were designated uh, for the growth at Marathon School in particular. So. Because of the increase in numbers there, roughly 20 new iPads would be going to Marathon for growth. The other are to replace ones that we can't update any longer, but need to for specific reasons. Whether it's meeting the needs of an individual student, whether it's replacing something in a classroom where it no longer works. So by putting those in the bid, it's actually saving the district money, getting better pricing versus just buying it straight out, out of maintenance or other accounts. And that's why we bundled that into this. That's great. Thank you for providing that detail. Sure. You're welcome. Um, I, I believe there was one other question that Amanda had brought up related to the usage of, uh, you know, Apple products uh, by the faculty where students are using Chromebooks. Could you just, uh, for everyone's sake, speak a little bit to that, the rationale behind that? Yeah, I mean, I think the district has supported um, Apple computers and has been a strategic initiative really since 2009. Um, and we have spent uh, a large number of hours and funds to train and prepare staff to use those tools. Um, and so the big purpose of doing that is that teachers still rely on a variety of software tools. Granted, many of those are web-based, right? So we use Google uh, Suite for a lot of basic office functionalities. We use a lot of web-based tools. Uh, things are definitely still hosted in the cloud. And so, yes, some of it is web-based, but some of it is also dependent on local software tools that teachers still rely on, uh, whether it's simply creating and editing photos for a classroom presentation, or whether it's a higher level math class still using Microsoft Excel um, to do the statistics they need. Um, there's a number of reasons why teachers uh, from a software standpoint still need them. And then from a strategic standpoint, we're tooled uh, to work with Apple products. And to change that strategy would require a big shift uh, in how we do business. We'd have to retrain staff all of our mobile management systems or platforms that push out software to all these devices would all have to be redone or replaced. And so I think it's a fair question to evaluate whether Apple is uh, the best or right product for the district, but at the same time, if we did that, there would be an increased cost that may not offset the extra cost of buying Apple to begin with. So I'm happy to entertain future discussions about a strategy in, in the fall, if that's what the school committee requires. But at this point, I think my, my strategy and the district strategy has been to support Apple computers for some of those reasons. And I don't know if that helps answer your question, Mina, but I'm, yeah, I'm happy no, to elaborate. It, it does, and I think it's in alignment with uh, what Dr. Kavanaugh had also shared okay. uh, with us. Uh, the other aspect that uh, you know we had discussed in the past year is some of this technology, especially in the elementary grades, and the outcome, the educational experience for students, where you know we've all, um, as parents, are so wary of technology usage, but at the same time, it, it's so necessary. Um, so, what is it, you know, with the investment that we are making in technology and all of this hardware, especially in the elementary grades? What is the outcome? What is the benefit? I think we've talked about it a little bit last year, 
and youth had uh, expressed a willingness to provide some kind of statistics and report around it. Perhaps that's something to look at um, along with what you're suggesting uh, for a strategy in the fall. Yeah, I'm happy to come back in the fall and report out on, you know, more specifically, you know, even some program evaluations. At this point, as mentioned before, we haven't done a full program evaluation since the beginning of the one-to-one -one program launch, you know, roughly six, seven years ago at the high school. Um, so I'm happy to do that if that's the, the school committee's desire. Um, I would just ask that you give us some time to get through some of the other strategic initiatives that we have, like launching the website and some other things that we're working on before we do that. Um, it's not a matter of not wanting to do that. We just, as a department, haven't really had the time to focus on you know, action research or looking at these programs and doing program evaluations recently. So we're happy to do that. We, we find value in doing that. We obviously don't want to waste community money on things that are not impacting students. Um, so I'm definitely willing to do that in the fall if, if that's what you would like to see. Thank you, Ashok. Mm -hmm. Your effort um, is, you know, very, uh, uh, very valued, and especially with the work on the website. So absolutely happy to wait, at least on my end. Don't want to speak for everyone. Okay. Yes, happy to wait. That's great. Then other questions? Are we ready to entertain a motion? I would like to move to approve the bid from Apple. I'll second it. Okay. Roll call. May. Aye. Okay. Jen. Yes. I am a yes. Mina. Yes. Okay. Unanimous and so passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that moves us into item I, which is a request to expend year end balances, and that is Dr. Kavanaugh. Yes. Typically, this would be Mrs. Rothermick, but she is on vacation this week. Uh, so, because we are at the end of the school year and then the end of the fiscal year, uh, what needs to happen is we have to sort of make all of our accounts right. Uh, so, I am requesting that you authorize Mrs. Rothermick to make expense transfers between funds as necessary so that she can close out the year-end balances for FY19. I mean, I'll just sort of give you an example of how that works. So right now, the cafeteria, for example, it's a revolving account and it's operating in the red. So we're going to need to move some money into that account just to make that account whole before we close things out. Uh, we have a couple of other expenditures that we need to make before the end of the school year. Uh, for example, we have looked at the middle school fitness center and in the fitness center, there may be four bicycles, uh, stationary bicycles. And if we take parts from two of them, we will have one whole bicycle in there. So the equipment has become quite decrepit. Uh, the same thing is true for treadmills. There are four treadmills in there right now. One is working. Um, so the room needs sort of an overhaul. And this is also a, a place where, in that fitness center, where uh, many of our students with special needs go for their physical education classroom. So I, I feel like. Um, leaving it the way that it is right now is kind of unconscionable for me. So we will need to take some money and put it there, which will mean that we'll be shifting money from one account to another. And then the third place where we found we need a little bit of assistance right now is in high school textbooks. When Mr. Bishop was here and talking about the increase in enrollment, what we've discovered is that for next year, given class sizes, we will need to purchase some textbooks to accommodate all of the kids. And that's true in social studies, math, and science. And in some cases, is um, the textbooks that we have currently can't be replaced because we can't buy extras because they are out of date. So we are going to need to purchase a whole new set of textbooks for those kids. Um, so that, that dollar amount could be as high as $50,000 at the end of this year. But sure. because the money is there in accounts, it makes sense to purchase them now rather than to tax the FY20 budget. So um, that's... That's what we're looking at for end of year expenditures and, and transfers. Dr. Kavanaugh, did you share what the total amount is or a ballpark? Uh, so I think what we were looking at for the fitness equipment is probably around 30,000 and the textbooks are about 50,000. Um, and then, you know, obviously we have to make food service whole and there's circuit breaker money there as well so uh, when when you meet in july on the 18th mrs rothmick will obviously give you the entire end of year expenditure report so that you can see how all of that money is played out Great. so about eighty thousand for those two items yes 
and really at this point that's you know just kind of a guess because we don't have all of the POs ironed out but they will be very shortly because June 30th is just around the corner so we have some positive variances in some other places that we can move things from that's correct okay. yes yeah okay. all right all right I move to approve the expense transfers I'll second it roll call I Nick, Jen yes I am a yes and Mina yes okay. <clears throat> thank you that's great Yes, this looks really good. That moves us into item J, which is policy, policy BEHD, public participation at school committee meetings. This is a first reading, and I know that it did go out by listserv. Um, but that's you, Dr. Kavanaugh. Yes. Uh, so what you are seeing in front of you in your packet, the public participation at school committee meeting policy, uh, you'll notice that it is not redlined. We currently have a policy, but this is pretty much an entirely revised policy. Um, the Natick Public Schools have gone through, I think, two years of litigation around this policy. Um, and what they have found, and we attended a session with lawyers from the ACLU, uh, is that there are very infrequent times when you, are at, when you are able to ask a person to stop speaking at a public meeting. And so much of what they've learned and much of the legal outcomes are in this policy. Um, Pretty much this is Natick's policy. When we had our last policy subcommittee meeting, uh, Jen and I went through it and we made some very subtle changes to it. Uh, at, in the Natick meeting, they asked people to sign up. We left the sign up language in here in number one. Uh, we very infrequently have people come to public comment. They left mm -hmm. the sign up language in there because they so frequently do that they can only really allot 15 minutes to public speak or they wouldn't be able to conduct the business of the school committee. Um, so that's that's there and, and we can think about whether or not we want to leave it there. It doesn't feel to me like it's hurting anything right? to have it. Um, in number two, we had the language that says that people are advised against specifically naming students or district employees, and it does say advised against because legally you cannot stop someone from naming a school employee or a student. Um, in the third one, the three minutes to present your material, we just have to be very cautious that regardless of the topic, three minutes is, is three minutes. Um, Number four can be very tricky. The things that fall within the scope of the school committee's authority, um, even though it might feel like things do not, in a lot of ways, a lot does touch upon the work that you do. Um, so, for example, if you know a group of parents came and said that they wanted, you know, a basket weaving course, you, know, you may say that curriculum isn't, but the funding of that would be. So that's how, in some ways, you can make a case that things are are related to the work that you do. Um, and then just number eight, which is the disclaimer, because of constitutional free speech principles, the school committee does not have the authority to prevent all speech that may be upsetting and or offensive at public comment, um, and that is pretty broad. So Natick will tell you that they have tolerated quite a bit of speech that, that they were not able to shut down. Uh, number seven speaks to the, the things that will allow you to shut things down, um, and that would be if there was a, something that was a true threat. Um, so even if someone makes a threat, you have to believe in its credibility for you to, to stop that speech. Um, the, the stuff at the bottom would not be here, but Natick did give us some suggested stopping language in the event that we felt that someone who was here for public comment um, was out of order. You would simply, Madam Chair, point of order and ask the question um, whether it did or did not pertain to school committee business or whether it was you know, a true th threat or something that was prurient in nature. So. That's what we have there right now. We are happy to take any kind of feedback from the committee. This is really a first read. Um, can I ask a question about number three? In the past, is that what we've allowed? I'm sorry, I, I don't remember. It three is. Three minutes? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Did, was there any feedback for, or questions or comments from the public, either Mina, that you received or that you received, Dr. Kavanaugh? We did not. No, I did not either. Um, I have a couple of uh, questions. So in our case, we have public comment both at the beginning and at the end of the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I felt that that needs to be reflected in this. Okay. 
Um, the other question I had was that the formatting of this looked a little different than how we have our policy set up. Is there any The box is different. The, there's not the typical box at the bottom, is that what you mean? Yes, and you know, the references and the timelines and whatnot, and it talks about adoption with the signature and, uh, you know, date. Yes, so it, you know, if, if, when, if and when this is approved, it will you know, mirror the other policies that we have, and especially now as we're working toward the new website, we've done a lot of work in kind of cleaning them up to ensure that they are all in the same font, the same size font, that the formatting is the same, because what we were finding is that they were all over the place. So yeah, that's been I, a lot of work. I'm going to encourage the, the moving away from the boxes at all as a future suggestion. It's fine for, I guess, a, a document, but it doesn't translate well to the website. It's sure, a table. Yeah. table's not uh, easily readable on, on a web version. So we've kind of migrated away yeah. from those tables on the website. So just food for thought. But Yeah, that's good to know. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, yeah that, that's good feedback. It was more about you know, being able to capture that kind of information. The formatting could be what works best um, in the new setup that we have for the website. But I think it talks about the date and the first reading, et cetera, and the adoption. Um, so those, those were typically the comments, but uh, I'm very glad to see this. Uh, and you know, this is certainly a conversation in Massachusetts. So thank you for bringing this up. Yes, this is something that's happening statewide. You know, we won't be the only school committee looking at this. So the, the one thing that jumps out to me, and I don't, I don't know how I feel about it, honestly, is the signing up for public comment. And mm -hmm. the reason it jumps out at me is because our meetings at times can be lengthy. And people that co come in that are going to speak, if we have a, a comment period at the end, if they have to be there at the beginning to sign up, that's inhibiting a little mm -hmm. bit people's ability to participate. Mm -hmm. So I would want to know if we're going to put that in the policy, how if there's a way to reduce that barrier to how we're going to go about the sign up. If it's not at the very beginning would be my preference. Um, I don't know. I don't, have a, I don't have a better idea off the top of my head. That just jumped out at me. Maybe we could put a sign up sheet on a table yeah. and direct them to sign it if they come in at 914. I think the only caution is that you want to keep public comment at a minimum so that you can conduct your business. So, I mean, you could certainly set up time parameters that are your own, you know, or sign up methods that are your own for sure. Has there ever been, yeah. since you've been here the longest, an instance where public comment became really lengthy? In so, your... Not since I've been on the school committee, okay. but in, because I used to follow the school committee for the paper, uh -huh. there was back, in, I don't remember what year it was, there was a proposal to eliminate the drama class, mm. and there was a tremendous amount of feedback from the public. It wasn't unruly or anything. And it, but there were a lot of people that came. There were a lot of people that did come. Because I think for something like that, later on down at um, number five says large groups addressing the same right. topic are encouraged. I mean, for sure, everyone yes. could speak, but they are encouraged to consolidate their remarks. So, I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to the idea of getting rid of the sign up. Um, and if there were ever such a time that it got a little unruly, we could right. consider adding it back into the policy. But I feel like so, in, w within the sort of foreseeable past, it's been fairly, you know, every once in a while there'll be an issue. There are quite a few folks that show up to speak about, but I don't feel like it took an enormous chunk of time. Right. You know, even th when we discussed the um, transportation yeah, policy, that's what I was thinking. That was of. not. I mean, lengthy. it may have been a little more than 15 minutes, but I don't feel like it got to the point where it really became prohibitive to, to us finishing out that particular meeting. So if, um, if folks are up for it, I wouldn't mind at least eliminating the sign-up piece and then revisiting it if we needed to. Um, so I, I just want to, um, you know, Jen, you, you bring up a good point of looking at some examples that we have had in our district, right? So I think in the time that you and I have served, I think one of the biggest runs we saw was around the transportation, yep. right? Yep, definitely. Um, and, and I think uh, the folks in the community were uh, extremely civil in terms of uh, the timing that they utilized and how they came up to speak. And even uh, their dissatisfaction, they expressed it in, in a very respectful manner. So that's our district how we have functioned so far. Right. But I think what this is trying to do is to look at some other districts 
which, you know, had these incidents, uh, which got a little out of control, if you will, right? And it's trying to preempt that. And I think that's the point from where this is coming. I guess I don't see how the having a sign up prevents that, though. I, that's the connection that I'm missing, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I agree with what you're saying. Yep. I mean, I think it is set up, you know, to, to sort of preempt any issues. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I think if folks want to speak, we can't really stop them. So. Well, I think the reason that they have the sign up in Natick is that they'll get 20 people who all want to come and make some kind of public comment. And if there's a 15 minute time period that's limited, you know, they get there early and put their name down. They so do. they're. they're a short a spot so so I'm and maybe at this I didn't pick up on so there's three minutes per person but they cap it so that they can't go over the 15 minutes right exactly. and in some cases if you don't use your whole 15 minutes or people will agree to speak to, uh, your whole three minutes or people will agree to go to two minutes instead you know they kind of work it that way and there was language in Natick's example yes. that spoke to that so it said something like you know if 10 people sign up each person is allotted a minute and 30 seconds if eight people sign up each person is allotted two minutes and we actually decided seconds. to take that, that language out because it was so specific mm -hmm. so prescriptive right we want mm -hmm. we're we're in a lucky position right now where we actually want people to come and participate yes. we don't want to dissuade folks from from coming so i, I mean but you're right. I, I you've, we're, it's trying to eliminate the possibility of a bad situation from taking place. So I, you know, I can see that too. But either way, I mean, I don't mind the sign up being in there, but I would welcome the thought, the idea of getting rid of it too. Right. And, I'm in the and same Jen, place. I, uh, yeah. you know, you you make a, that excellent point again. We are in that place where we want public participation. Mm -hmm. We want to hear from parents. Yeah. And I think even in this other case, that will still happen. And um, I think. Many times it's, it's think about, I'm thinking town meeting, right? Mm -hmm. When you hear the same message over and over again, right? Is that helpful? So we do want to take the message that we are hearing from the group or group of people in that 15 minutes and that may be sufficient to, for us to reflect and work on it and that it doesn't disrupt the business for which we have come to meet. I think that's how I read it but absolutely uh, you know, open to how the committee, the, everyone else feels and what Dr. Kavanaugh um, have, may have also researched. MASC hasn't updated their version yet too, so we don't, have, not. a, um, we don't have a framework. We have Nadix, that's our framework. So I mean, the sign up doesn't really, I'm kind of ambivalent about it. So if someone feels strongly, go for it but i don't if, feel strongly about it but yeah. i mean we could just put a piece of paper out there and yeah. have people sign up if we remember to right. <laughs> <laughs> add that to the list of yeah. things to do right i don't feel strongly about it but i i would prefer not to have it but okay. i don't feel like that's not i don't think it is substantially going to change the public comment we have or don't have i think right. yeah i don't we, think it we is get either. what we get um but it, so that would just be my okay. two cents. So for a second reading, do you like leaving in the 15 minute yes. public comment period? Yes. <laughs> the sign up piece is the part I'm on the fence about. The 15 <laughs> minutes I feel like is, is if, if there's an issue in the agenda that folks would like to speak to, 15 minutes is a, a good amount of time to have that opportunity, I feel like. And if they want to see to the end and have another 15 minutes, they could too. So really, That's there's sort of a half there's, an hour there's, potential. There's a half an hour potential. Right. Right. And Nancy, I think, I think you, you bring up that good point. And hopefully, some folks are watching. And maybe we'll get some more feedback between now right. and the second reading. I always hope for feedback. <laughs> <laughs> so Miss, maybe in the second reading, suggestion. could it be? Of course, um, yes. well, was. You know, we kind of bracket it as still up to some thought but when we come back for our next meeting and Amanda will be here too and then we can kind yes. of figure out whatever, get a little more consensus about it. I mean, like I said, I don't really... Yeah. And, and I, I, I could probably be swayed. Yeah, either idea. way. It's, yeah, yeah. I, I think talking about it again would be good because what if someone reads this and they're worried that they haven't signed up in time because there are no parameters set for mm -hmm. 
what point by which do you need right. to sign up? Right. Right. So you don't want That's... to discourage people from coming if they think I missed the deadline. Right. Right. So right. Mm -hmm. right. We will Mr. return Judge. to it. I'm just going to have a minor suggestion. It may not be helpful, but I think if you do have a time limit of 15 minutes, is it possible to leave some authority up to the chair to even extend that time in, in special situations when we right. do have people that are showing up? There are definitely moments in history where they come where you want a lot of that feedback. That's so right. just don't, right. don't trap yeah, yourself right. into the 15 minutes because you may want to extend that time to maybe 30 exactly. to like hear that. all the representatives in that, mm -hmm. in that room. So that, that might be, you know, leave yourself some wiggle room with an extension there. I like that. Right. And that yeah. also allows yeah. for if we're, go back to the example Mina said, if we're hearing the same comments over and over, it wouldn't make sense to extend it. But there might be a time when we're hearing on multiple issues at the same meeting, and it might make sense for the chair to have that authority. Yeah, that's right. So as and we're doing... Ashok, your, your feedback is so appreciated. Thank you. Good idea. I've seen a few meetings where it's... <laughs> Where it's going a little longer. So as right. we're revising this, we'll revise number six as well. What was six again? Because if, if you don't have a lot of time, we'll just leave it to say speakers who require reasonable accommodations on the basis. Yes. Right? Yes. yes. Right. So yes. we'll start right there. All right. So we will bring this back for a second reading, and we'll have the uh, policy subcommittee take a look at that again. All right. That's great. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So that moves us down into policy IJOA field trips for our first reading, Dr. Kavanaugh. All right. And Jen, you can feel free to jump right in on this one because I think you were perhaps more in tune to this one, but this one has come back because we were interested in looking at um, just emergency communication protocols, really. I mean, that was the big driver for this one. Right, um, because um, the the communication plan, I think, was the big piece that was added in this one. Um, that's the real major addition to the third paragraph from the bottom. Um, it, it, I think it makes good sense. If, if planes are delayed or if we're in a place where there's no cell phone service, there needs to be someone who picks up the actual payphone in the, you know, wherever you are and, and makes a call to someone who can get the word out. So just to make sure that parents are informed about where their, their kids are if there's, if there's a delay. So um, that's the big um, addition is that third paragraph from the bottom. We also considered some language about um, scheduling field trips, and that was one of the things that um, Amanda was, was thinking as we were updating this. Um, but just, just in the interest of full disclosure here, the conversation um, with Dr. Kavanaugh, you can jump in now if you want to, but with faculty and administration, um, basically they do consider what's going on in the school and they make their decisions for field trips with those, you know, with tests and um, other clubs and organizations, you know, they, they have that on their radar. Um, but for example, um, we can't rule out field trips during MCAS because only the 10th grade takes MCAS. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's more about making sure that the faculty are available to the students um, who need to be available mm -hmm. and not necessarily about whether there's a test specifically. Um, so um, the other thing Amanda mentioned were AP exams, but same thing, AP exams affect a a specific group of students that may or may not be involved in a certain organization that's taking a field trip and and in the you know the event that it is the student is aware of it ahead of time and you know they know they have to figure out how they're going to handle the situation um, so we pretty much kept the adjustments to the emergency communication plan and I think that's pretty much it can you, is there anything else? Did I leave anything out? The categories we added, but that was that was it. Yeah, I think that the categories existed without being called categories. Right, right. right? It just made better sense, I think, to cleaner. It looks good to me. Um, but are there other comments? I don't know. Did you receive I, anything? I had something, Did but uh, if someone else has something to say, should I go? So go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Um, so I was just wondering if, as a result of some of these additional measures that have been added, some of the uh, forms that we have would capture more detail. 
we spoke about that in the meeting about how we needed to include that emergency communication piece as part of the field trip process so that we're we that that's not part of our policy so um it would be something that we wouldn't necessarily have to see and vote on but we want to make sure that that communication piece is when they bring a field trip to us that would be part of that packet of information that's presented to us so whether it's a separate form or it's in, integrated into the existing um, forms that folks fill out when they present i mean we don't want to add more another form that somebody else has to fill out, you know? But if we could tack it onto an existing form just to make sure that that information is there. Yeah, no, uh, so, you know, Jen, as I was reading um, that, so I'm glad, you know, you've all looked at it and considered that. So it sounds like some of that responsibility is, you know, falling on us when I look at that language. Um, that's where I always get a little concerned that we are taking this on or at requesting for more of this. So we just need to make sure that on the uh, procedure side, that is taken care of. And as long as there is some kind of a time commitment or as we get to approve this, that that will get updated, whatever is the timeline. Right, that right. Works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as we've looked at some of those field trip forms, there's not a lot of consistency either in the layout of those, so they might need a little cleaning up as well yeah. before we migrate. That's great. So That's good. Thank so you. So should we? Of course, absolutely. Um, should we? I, I mean, if you feel comfortable with it, great. But should we bring it back just for a second reading when Amanda's here too? Just I think so. I mean, she's part of the I policy think, yeah, working think so. group, and yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Bring it back for a second. And if you have any input, you can let us know. But. Just so yeah, she has a chance to doing good stuff speak there. her piece. Okay, good. Good. Yeah. All right. All and right. I've shared this with Mr. Bishop as well. So, I mean, I think the high school is probably the school that it most impacts, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that moves us into item L, which is the calendar subcommittee, uh, Dr. Katz. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, Nancy, uh, yes. If, if may I request, you know, we are talking about all the subcommittees a little bit. Mm -hmm. Would it be okay to switch? The discussion could we talk about the next item first and then come to this? Sure. Would that be okay, Dr. Sure. Kavner? Sure, that's fine. Right, so that moves us then into item M, which is school committee liaisons and roles. Um, so I guess uh, you know, every year we look at our subcommittee assignments and liaison roles. And um, earlier in the year and even in late fall, we had looked for verbiage of what each of these subcommittees mean and do to be updated on the school website. And so what you see in front of you is really a description which came from many of the members themselves who have been part of it. And this is an attempt to kind of expand and look to capture um, the effort involved in each of these um, subcommittees and liaison roles. And if some of them are termed um, how are they aligned to the function that we have? What is the effort uh, that it takes so that there is a better understanding as we are looking to sign up um, to various roles and whatnot? Um, so I guess to me, uh, one of the things that struck out as I was jotting down some of the effort, uh, you know, these are estimates, obviously. So if you look at, say, um, the community communications, which is line item number 13. My estimate of it is it takes about three to six hours per month on that particular um, subcommittee, um, where, you know, whether it is emails or attending the meetings or some follow-up or looking at meeting minutes or what have you, or, or bringing up an agenda item. So it, it's all inclusive of that. So if you look, um, to see various other aspects. Um, I've made an attempt to the ones which I was familiar with to add those items. So if you look at item number 21, which is the tech item, um, you know, the, um, uh, Walpole is nearly an hour away. So you have that, you have to be prepared for what uh, the meeting is all about. Uh, make sure you have some questions back and forth because it's, it's a voting member role. And many times they have some fabulous programming that you're attending. So this is more an average, if you will, of about four to six hours per month working on the tech initiative. 
So um, I, I thought it is a good idea to spell this out a little bit. So we can look at what is the effort that each member ha is putting into all of this besides the biweekly meetings um, that we have to prepare for research, executive sessions, etc. Um, so what I was hoping is we look at this, this list is nearly 30, there are two items which are added a little later on. One was uh, something that came from Jen Devlin, which is the Planning Board Growth Study Committee, um, and also the new request um, around the calendar subcommittee. So my hope is to look uh, for all of us to really take a look at all of these items and see which of these are absolutely needed and which of these we could possibly sunset. And if there are some which we can consolidate in terms of the subcommittees so that we are uh, more reasonable in terms of asking the time of our um, members and look to see how is it that ultimately aligned with the school committee functions and goals and supportive of our district strategic plan, right? So uh, if we look at, for instance, item number 16, which is the Metro West Innovative Education Roundtable Consortium. Um, there had, you know, it was an initiative that was started and it would be great to continue to have that, but if it's not there, should we be looking to sunset it or what should be the approach there? So I would like us to look at each of these items um, and scrutinize um, whether we need it, is it, um, is it ready to be sunset over a period in time? So my request today, and with Amanda also not present, uh, for all of us to look at each of these items, especially the ones which we're very close to, to add some detail around what is the effort that it takes to be part of it per month, um, so that whoever is signing up has some idea. Um, look to see if there is some description that could be added. And I think as we plan in the upcoming months, look to see how is it aligned to our goals. Uh, and the school committee function. That was my hope uh, in terms of looking at all of these items. To me, uh, nearly 30 roles, and I know some of them are heavier, some of them aren't, uh, but does it make sense to have so many and are we able to do justice to all of this? Are we diluting some of our efforts? So that's where I was coming at it from and expanding and kind of taking a more holistic look at it. And Mina, is it okay to send around the link to Melrose Public Schools, which I was looking at? They have 3,900 students in their district and seven school committee members, and they have three subcommittees. And I just thought, I, I mean, I don't feel wed to the idea, but I think it's interesting for us to look at another way of sure. collecting and organizing these. They have a subcommittee on educational programs, one on finance and facilities, and one on policy and planning. And so say two school committee members will take each subcommittee and then they'll have separate meetings and presentations. And so it's just a thought. That's all. Can, is, am I allowed to email that or will I be arrested? Open meeting I think I think you can email that, uh, Meg. Nancy, I didn't mean to speak out of turn. No, no, you're fine. I um, it was thinking uh, uh, back to what you were saying about adding detail to this, which is that it might be helpful to clarify in each of these that some of these are not subcommittees but liaison roles in which ongoing participation is not a requirement, that it's sure. kind of popping it, being in touch and knowing what's going on to be able to represent the school committees. Uh, particular needs and bring back, for example, with the planning board, their right. particular needs. Right, right, right. Yeah. And, and I think it always, um, you know, depends on the individual members too, sometimes what they want to make of it. And sometimes it's also the demand of the hour. For instance, right now with the growth that we have going on, um, I am personally of the opinion that a uh, closer tie with the planning board mm -hmm. is helpful. Right. Right, so if we look at just voting members, well, we it's a different time period where it may not be the, you know, may not be the hot topic.
So, and then I, just jumping specifically into the bridge, I'm going to send you, if it's okay, some verbiage that reflects also the policy and procedure piece that the bridge is looking at. Just that's, to. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, uh, this is on the, uh, you know, I didn't make it, I, I think I made it shareable, but not editable, but I will open it up um, for folks to enter in their particular description. Um, so you can just add it right into the spreadsheet, Nancy, or you can email it to me and I'll add it. If you make it editable, editable I am happy to do it so you're not okay. stuck editing a whole document. But um, I just wanted to reflect that because that's very specifically a school committee function. Sure. Right, and as, as Meg's sending this email, the other yeah. thing that I was looking at is I wonder if Melrose is only posting the committees for which they have a voting member, as opposed to like, you know, I, I wonder if they assign, like, does someone go sort of keep their eye on the, the selectmen meetings? And um, because it looks like we only have four voting member subcommittees, but we have whatever, 30 liaison rules. Um, yeah, so that's another big question, I guess. Yeah. 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 And, and I think I, some of I, these one of my uh, sorry, go ahead, Dr. Kavanaugh, you're about to say something. Oh, I was just gonna say some of these naturally sunset. So right. Like the right. calendar they, committee, the website committee, those will go away over time, but there are others that will remain in existence right. forever. Like you'll always want a liaison to the planning board. Right. 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 And even look at yes. I mean, center school reuse is is done. Yes. You know that committee is done. So in another year elementary school building committee will right. be done. So in the, the Metro West uh, Roundtable Consortium is the, we only actually met, I think, once or twice in the fall. It's not clear. There were some things that the school committee member from another district had organized it, and there are a couple of other school committee members. It just has not really gelled forward because there are things going on in their particular lives. So I'm not sure if that's intended to continue on or not. Uh, right. And I can look into that when we bring this back to discuss with when Amanda's here. Right, and and the other point too, Mina, that I think y you make a good point. Some of these are more labor intensive. Some, you know, are, are just pretty much in name only. Mm -hmm. But I think some of them like, for example, the uh, budget advisory group probably isn't really hit very hard right now, but by November, the workload in increases significantly and stays pretty high until May and then it you know so it's the time frame is you know you might have six months of pretty light work and then yeah. six months where you're putting in a ton of time mm -hmm. yeah right right and and Jen I you know I also remember as we got on the school committee together you know we were we realized how much work it is right so I think um, this is a good opportunity to kind of relook at what is truly needed and, you know, how do we encourage folks, you know, this is serious work commitment. Right. Right. That first so people year. really need to be aware of it um, ahead of time. And I also think that we need to be conscientious that um, serving on the school committee should be a possibility for a full-time working person. And um, and is it? So that that's something for us to think about. And um, I think the other aspect is, um, you know, there are functions, um, and I think it has evolved over a period in time. And each one of us have taken different aspects. I will speak for myself that when we created the community communications group, um, the goal was to create that link between the community and the schools, right? Mm -hmm. To have those conversations and create that open dialogue. But I think at this point, each and every um, I, uh, of those roles, I think is up for conversation for us for to self-reflect on areas which are under our purview and come back and say, what makes sense? What can we uh, consolidate? So if we have policies, should we consolidate policies and procedures? rather than having policies separate from procedures. So we can have all of that conversation. And I just wanted us to think of it along those lines. So that's all I have. And so, I'll open it up for editing for everyone. That's great, so, Mina. So. Thank you. I, I was just going to ask, is, that, is the end goal for tonight just to, to take a look at this, that um, 
this sheet that you put together and, and are, are we working on it tonight? Um, so I, to me, the goal is to take a look at it and just share some of these thoughts. And if this is making sense, the path around consolidation, the path around what is the effort and time that it takes and how is it that it's aligned. Um, so it's just a start of a conversation and perhaps over the summer, we look to see how we could possibly um, you know, reconfigure some of this okay. and um, look at assignments and what is it that everyone's interested in uh, working on in the upcoming year. We could also create another subcommittee, <laughs> Mina. The subcommittee what? to discuss <laughs> subcommittees. <laughs> Sorry, we could also create another subcommittee. Uh -huh. To discuss the subcommittee. That was kind of a joke. <laughs> uh, we need those last ones in a while, for sure. All right. All right, thank you. So it, with regard to the calendar subcommittee, is that time sensitive that you need that? I'm just. Well, it sort of is. We, you know that we sent the letters out. They right. went out right. to the faculty. They went out to students. They went out to parents. We have, I should say families, we have four faculty, one of whom will be the HTA rep. We have four students who are interested in participating. Oh, we have many parents. And George outreach, Georgette reached out to clergy today. So I think if we wait until July 18th to... We're pushing into the beginning of school. We are pushing it into the beginning of school, and I was really hoping to get a lot, some of this work you know, underway in the summertime, at least. OK. okay. So um, Dr. Kavanaugh, do you know if Amanda expressed any interest in uh, serving on that? She meeting? has not. We communicated several times. She has not indicated. Okay. One way or the other. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I wonder if anyone uh, present is interested. I'd be happy to. We need one proponent of Karl Marx's birthday. I was thinking <laughs> we could have a Karl Marx subcommittee. That went, went through my head. Yes, we yes, a Karl Marx subcommittee. <laughs> New ways to celebrate that great man's day. There we go. So... It, Looking yeah, if for you a motion to appoint Meg then to be on the calendar subcommittee. Um, so moved. Go, Meg. Thank you, Meg. Sure. So, we'll do a roll call to be official. You need a second first, though. Oh, I'm just sorry. Yeah. Oh, yes. Sorry. So, yes. So, you moved that. I will second that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Meg? Aye. Yes. I am also a yes. And Mina? Yes. Okay, that is wonderful. Congratulations you. on your new assignment. Why, thank you. Thank you, Meg. And, and Dr. Kavanaugh, in terms of the term for this, I recall um, in your earlier memo that it ends on December 1st. Is that right? Well, we are hoping that we have something in place by December so that we can make a recommendation to the committee so that next January, when you're adopting the calendar for 2021, that will be in place. 2021 sounds so far it does. away, and it's not. I was in 1819 when I, oh no, I was in 1921. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always thought you were very, you know, futurist. Progressive. Yes. <laughs> yep. yeah. So, and, and Nancy, you have a lot of experience, uh, and I don't know how that could also be tapped from the previous uh, I will. Yeah, I am somebody. happy to share all of my notes um, from the first round, which may or may not be relevant this time around. You can decide that yourself. Thank you. Thank you. So that then moves us into old business item A, which is the new website presentation from Mr. Ghosh. Thank you. This is, this is really exciting. I am excited. I, I know, know you guys have worked so hard with the subcommittee and all the work that I know I have heard from Amanda has really been, you guys have really just been working, you know, triple time or quadruple time even to get this up and running in time. Yeah, there's been a lot of folks working in concert to, to kind of get us to where we are today. Um, and I, I think in honor of Amanda, I think we're gonna try to do more of a full on display with fireworks uh, later on when she can be here. That's okay, yeah. So, yes. so I, I wanna give you kind of uh, primarily an update of like dates and right. launch time frames and what to expect so the community has a good understanding of that as well. Uh, but then also to show you some of the pages and to give you a sense of what's going to be ready and what's coming out. But then if you would be willing to invite us back when Amanda's here, maybe at the end of July, July. or August, once the, the school sites are up and live. If you're free on we, July 18th. Yeah, <laughs> we can we can do that and, and come back if that, if that works. Yeah. 
So, okay. so that would be the plan for tonight. So I don't think we're going to go in depth of every single page tonight. And I don't think you want to see every single page tonight. <laughs> um, so that's that's where we're at. So I think just to talk to the committee about right. dates, I think in the packet there was a memo uh, from me just kind of highlighting some of the, the key dates. Um, and the first, uh, just so that the community knows and the committee knows, is that on June 25th, by kind of the end of day, June 25th, our contract really with our current vendor, Blackboard expires. And there's gonna be a plus or minus of a few days, but that site will basically go down, which is our current main domain, our hopkinton.k12.ma.us site. So that will go down on June 25th. Um, on June 26th, our plan is to temporarily put up uh, a site, which is this site called HPS Digital, which is our technology secondary site that we have. It's a blog more, more so of what we're doing in the, in, the, in the schools, but we've posted on this site just some key links for um, the community to get to some things if need be in the rough week or so before the new site comes up. Okay, so from here, they'll be able to get to primarily the online registration process. So if you're new to the community and we don't know who you are yet, we can't send you an email, they can come at least to the site and register their students uh, for, for the district. At the same time, they can get into the parent portal to get access to the, the things that they need. Uh, and then there's basic contact information for all of the schools. So this, this site will be up in that kind of week gap to kind of hold us over until the new site comes up. So we will share this with the community, but the site will automatically be pointed to it. So when you log in and type in our address, this is gonna come up. So we'll get basic information. Um, so that's happening roughly on June 26. Uh, on July 1st, the subcommittee is meeting. Uh, we are going to try to have a vote to approve the district homepage, um, which is pretty much ready to go. And you'll be seeing some of that tonight. Uh, so we're hoping for a, a vote on July 1st. Uh, July 8th will be the official launch date of the district site where the district really goes public with the district pages and that should be up and running by noon uh, on July 8th. Um, on August 5th, the school sites, which is all the, the, the main primary five schools that have their own, their own sites with their own home pages will go live on August 5th, uh, roughly around, around noon. Uh, then kind of between August and September, we have a warranty period, a testing period um, with all of the pages, all the sites with final sites. So we'll be going through checking them. They'll be checking code, making sure all the bugs are worked out. If there's some changes, we'll make them uh, as we see fit. Uh, behind the scenes, we'll be updating pages still and adding more information as we, as we get it. Uh, we do have some people still working to proofread and to check for spelling errors and grammatical errors and making sure everything looks good. So that will be happening all summer long. So there may be some things that aren't perfect, but we're trying to do our best to clean those up before we launch. So that's kind of the, the schedule in a nutshell. There are questions kind of about the, the schedule or the process to kind of get us transitioned over to the new site. I have one sure. that just came to me. I should have mm -hmm. asked this in advance. So there are um, events happening and I don't know the dates off the top of my head, but you know, events at Hopkins, like popsicles on the playground, or for example, mm -hmm. is there a place where families can, will that information be on that transitional website, sort of a calendar of what's happening in the schools? We can, it isn't yet, but we can add it. So we can try to embed those school calendars or maybe put links since there are, there are existing Google calendars. Okay. We'll, we'll add the links to those calendars on it. We haven't done that yet, but we will. Okay. It's a good suggestion. Yeah, so Miscellaneous we can do stuff that. happening at the schools, yeah, yeah for, for no, new students. Okay. That's a good tip. We'll, we're happy to do that. Okay. I'll make a note. Perfect. Other questions just about the schedule or the timing? It's exciting. Okay. It is. It is. It's two weeks. I know. Just... We right. just snap their fingers just like and it just yeah. happens, just, you know? Definitely <laughs> so, nothing happening in the background. Nothing. Yeah, so. Yeah. Mr. Ghost won't be sleeping for <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, so we, um, so let's just take a look. Uh, we'll, we'll show you um, kind of the, I think the, the home page of the district site. So what you're seeing here is the district home page. Um, you, we've got basically uh, our utility menus, and I, I, you won't be able to see this probably from the screen, but across the top you'll have uh, our schools, so you'll be able to click on and get to any of the schools. 
Uh, then you'll have a direct link um, to a family, a students and family page, where basically everything you need as a, a student or a family will be kind of all organized around, around one page. And then a link to the staff site. The staff site will be a, a login-based secure page where they log in, they have access to all of their links, all of the information they need, and things that we need to keep private on a portal type uh, experience, we can do that on the, the sign-in um, page. So that's kind of across the top. Um, and then there's a translate button built in, so you can kind of easily click on this and translate the website into a number of languages. Uh, and that's quite easy to do. And the real cool new thing is this Find It Fast button. Um, so when you click on this, you get this overlay of all the kind of things that you need uh, real, real quick. So lunch menus, online payment connections, news, uh, directions, contact information, transportation information, all of that can easily be kind of found in one spot. That's great. So you can either go right to the families page or you can kind of come here and quickly look something up. And this is a search bar. Not everything is completely kind of coded, but there's an advanced search functionality built in. So even if you want to type in like a policy, we haven't tagged every single policy yet, but you can quickly kind of type in names or short names of policies and then get to them quite easily. And you can do that even within Google. So if you know you want to look up the discrimination policy in Hopkinton, you type that into Google, it's going to automatically kind of go right to that page. So, awesome. right. so this is an example of a policy page since we're going that direction. So this is um, every single school committee policy is its own web page. Um, and so at the top, there's a little icon. You want to print it and get a PDF version. You can, you can print it or you can just view it as a web page. Um, down at the bottom, you can see where we tried to transition some of those boxes and we took away the tables and put all those legal references and, and notes down towards the bottom. So it's not a box, but it, it seems to work. And then when you scale the website, you know, when you go from this to like mobile, it scales nicely and you can read it all. If you if you keep the boxes or the tables in there, tables don't really scale well and, and it doesn't you can't really read it on a mobile phone. So by removing that, it's it's much easier to read on a mobile device. Um, at the top you can continue to search other policies, or if you want, we've organized policies on the right uh, based on their categories, um, and you can just pick a policy and it will just switch and go to uh, that policy that you want to see. If you want to go back to the home page, there's a there's a home page button at the top, and this is the kind of the main landing page for all school committee policies. So we kind of matched the existing site, but we hope to make we hopefully made it a little better. Like two years okay. on the policy <laughs> subcommittee, this is like night and day. This is fan people can actually find a policy. This is yeah. incredible. This is much so much better. You've got basic oh, wow, accordion drop downs yeah. to see oh, them. Yes. You click on it, it goes away, and you can click the next one. So you can kind of quickly see which ones you want, and then there's um, tabs up top to switch to the other categories. So one way to easily organize a lot of content um, and so you know Megan Georgette myself just within this these pages probably spent you know 40 to 80 hours of time <laughs> to, oh, wow. to do Fantastic. just those things so somebody needed to do that mm -hmm. yeah so it. hopefully we're pretty excited about that I hopefully that's gonna be a big transition from where we are it's now huge. with right. policies um, so hopefully that's um, pleasing and then you know just to show you in a nutshell if we had that first policy open, uh, and you want to translate that policy into another language. So let's pick my dad's native language of Bengali of all languages. You just click that language, and it translates the whole policy into that language for you. That's amazing. Uh, you don't have to worry about trying to figure that out with a PDF. That's which phenomenal. was a real which was a real problem before. Um, so that we're pretty we're pretty excited by, um, and we're happy to kind of see that. Um, so back to the home page, um, we've got these things called mega menus. So uh, as you scroll across the top, an underline tells you what page you're kind of hovering over, and then you've got mega menus with all of the um, sub pages below them. Um, nice. So, very nice. 
Yeah, so this is clean. It helps you kind of see things. Um, I you know, that one way to organize it employment, as an example, all these are job postings. Um, we took away the, the tables again, but when you click on them, it po pops up the, the posting. If you then want to scroll through all the postings, you can arrow over hmm. and it will just go down the list and you can read any of the individual job postings that are available cool. uh, right from the list. Yeah. And then if you this click on it, you can print it and, and download it. That's Sorry, great. I mean to go ahead. No, I'm saying this is light years ahead of what we currently have. Um, truly, mm. what a tremendous effort the committee has put in, Ashok. Uh, you know, under Amanda's leadership and your leadership and all the effort that everyone has put in. This is exactly what uh, a district of our uh, you know, standing should have as its face. So mm -hmm. thank you for all the effort that you have sustained over a year now and put this forward. Thank you so much. You're welcome. This is fabulous. Yeah. I appreciate it. It was, it was time and so we were ready. And I think we were trying to meet those goals of mobile friendly, accessible needs, translatable, cleaner, fresher, and more modernized. And I think nice. we're, we're hopefully hitting that target. Um, and just so you know, this is what we call a panel based um, page. So you kind of see a lot of this um, up front, but you also then can scroll down um, and you've got your calendar scroller here. So this will scroll three events at a time or you can kind of click through them with the arrows or if you click on the full menu, I'll get that in a second. It takes you to the full calendar where you have all sorts of choices. You can filter by the calendars you want to see um, and there's a bunch of things you can do print calendars, et cetera. So I'll show you that in a second. This is kind of our news and announcements section, uh, which we've kind of had before. So you basically can hover over, you click on it, uh, you'll get a little kind of pop-up of the details uh, of the particular announcement. So this is for shorter snippets of news and announcements that uh, the districts or the schools uh, will have out. Below it is something we have called the, the highlights from the hill. This is where you're going to see more of that blog type information or where there's a little more language or content uh, attached to each area. So, for example, these aren't all mapped out of what we want to be. But, for example, one of these right images might be like the student of the month. So instead of just a little snippet or announcement, you click on it and then you get the profile picture of the student. You get all the details of what was written up about that student. So you're, you're allowed to go in a little more depth hmm. with some of the news and what's going on either district wide or at a particular school. Um, the lower ones are actually little snippets. You have play buttons and they house videos. So we're going to connect to uh, HCAMS hmm. video sets or district level videos. It opens up into a little video player and you can kind of see uh, the content so we'll kind of support a hopkinton channel we'll support the hcam channels and you can see a bunch of videos that are hosted on youtube that's so awesome. that's that's pretty cool as you scroll down you've got some basic facts and figures about the district um, these are changeable we can add them update them as they they change um, the the schools will have something similar where they can update school facts uh, and then we have kind of a district level social media connection with Instagram, which will both uh, flow 10 pictures through at a time. And each of the schools will have their own Instagram accounts at the bottom uh, as well. So that kind of gives you with a footer at the bottom. So that kind of gives you, you know, this this one page, as Carol can attest to, was <laughs> many oh. meetings and revisions. Right? I think we went through, as you saw, some of the revisions, probably six different revisions to get the website. This is just one page right. to where it is now. Um, and so fabulous. a lot of discussion, a lot of yes and no's and collaboration. This is the face though, right? This, this is the is face of so it. This is the main homepage. Yeah. Uh, and there was a lot of panels that, that each had to be designed. Um, and so that's, that's what we ended up with. So hopefully you like it. Yes. Uh, and if yeah. not, well, it looks You're stuck with it for a little while. It's too late to call it. It looks fantastic. So that's, in a nutshell, I don't know how much more time we probably have to spend, but um, if there's anything in in particular you want to see, I'm happy to show you some of the district level stuff. Um, but it's all there. Uh, I can make some of these links available to you shortly, um, but it's, it's light years away. If you click on the curriculum overview, Got a nice highlight, if you can see, of staff. So 
the normal trend will be kind of a navigation of staff and directory information on the right and then more content on the left so for example if you were to go to the academics you know the arts arts tab you would kind of see um, basically department information on the on the right uh, so you have contact information a district overview high school level middle school and then elementary level so that's how it's based at the district level if you were coming at it from the high school level, it'd start on the high school page, you'd see the high school information first, and then you'd see the directory for the high school staff. Uh, so that's that's kind of the general layout of some of the department pages, uh, which is which is pretty exciting. And, and uh, they're still in development, but, but they're getting there. I was gonna say, those are beautiful. I haven't seen those before. They're oh yeah, really so, nice. so they're, they're coming along. We're pretty, we're pretty excited about it. Um, and then when you do get to the, the high school level pages and the um, middle school pages, we've incorporated some of the details of the program of studies. So for example, if you're at the high school art page, you'll see visual arts, you'll see drama, you'll see all the courses, you click on it and a little accordion opens and you can see the description right there. Oh, that's awesome. So that that is underway and is, is gonna be visible on the actual pages. Um, so, so we're getting there. I think that's kind of most of it in a nutshell. Um, you know, some of the other pages that we've tried to organize for quick stuff like school hours, um, we've kind of organized by each school. You've got school hours, drop off time, release times, you can quickly kind of grab that information or get to it mm -hmm. from some of the quick links. So lots of different ways to do this. Same for directions. If you want to click on directions, we've got a picture of the building, a Google map, you click on it, you can type in where you are and you can get a map right to the, right to the building. So uh, we've done that for all the buildings as well. So, so we're getting there. I think we're close. The district levels, the district pages are, are close. We'll be ready for the launch. A few more moving of pictures and touching up things and resizing things, but, but we're getting there. Looks so. great. It really looks fantastic. Thank you. And hopefully you get a little bit of sleep in the next two weeks, but yeah, it's so I mean, amazing. Yeah, I, I think we will, and uh, I think we're getting close, so. Yeah, I think, we to I think the community will be very impressed. Yeah. Excellent. It, it, the, I do think so too. The change from the old to the new is significant. Yeah, I think it'll be it'll be nice, and I think based on the data of like having you know fifty percent or a little less than fifty yeah. percent being mobile, it's hard to kind of see here. But even like if you scale, you'll get a sense when you scale like the browser of what will happen mobile. Like everything mm -hmm. shifts and resizes. So instead of seeing one calendar event, now you just see one, and you can still click through and get to the others. Mm -hmm. Uh, so everything just kind of scales um, to kind of be readable still on a mobile phone, which That's is great. nice, or any kind of mobile device that you're using, um, which is which is helpful. So <laughs> yes, and maybe Huge. a shout out to Linda Henderson, Crystal Ho. I mean, he's got a great team yeah. behind the scenes yeah. who have been. Yeah, they've they've been working uh, around the clock. So yeah, Amanda obviously at the at the helm in terms of running the subcommittee, arranging the meetings and setting all the dates. Georgette for helping book all of the dates in the, the rooms. Uh, Linda and Crystal and Stephanie in terms of our staff who have not only helped migrate the data. Um, we even had some help, outside help from um, Olivia Harvey in photography. So oh, she came great. in and took us, took some photos and helped take some of these photos. And she's going to be back in the fall. So I think I would like to reach out to all of you to still get some more photos of all of you um, this fall, if possible, to add to the site, if you're willing to do that. Um, so Olivia Harvey helped out. Um, and then obviously the, the staff. Uh, beyond that, the, the subcommittee, you know, Kelly was a huge... Um, member of it and Meredith there's a number and we should name each one I think when we have time when Amanda's yeah. here and kind of thank mm -hmm. them all individually but they worked hard clearly so yeah hopefully it's it shows <laughs> it definitely shows you're so. having a party to celebrate you need well, that a may, launch party um that well will maybe July 18th is that <laughs> what I'm hearing is a possible July date 18th. so July 18th could be that that day TJ's not on school. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You're, You're welcome. welcome. Looks the informal yes. launch. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So that brings us up to the next opportunity for public comment. I do not see any uh, members out in the audience um, that wish to speak in the public. So that will bring us then into uh, items by consensus. Okay, so as superintendent, I recommend that the school committee vote to 
um, uh, sorry, to uh, <laughs> approve the items by consensus as outlined in the agenda. I move to approve the items by consensus. I will second. And a roll call starting with Meg. Hi. Jen. Yes. I am a yes. And Nina. Aye. Okay, so that will then move us into looking for a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. I'll second. Okay, a roll call. Meg. Aye. Jen. Oh, no, yes. I am a yes. And Nina. Yes. Okay, so we are adjourned at 8.50 p.m. Our next meeting is on June 28th, and I believe that meeting is going to take place in the library conference room. Is that right, Mina? That is correct. So, and I will be, I have an unavoidable or unmovable appointment, so I will not be there for at least the first hour, and as Mina will be remote, we will need another person to preside over the meeting. It probably makes the most sense to have Jen do it, since that make, would make you the longest um, serving unless somebody else has a veteran. Either way, it doesn't matter to me. I, and I'm sorry, uh, Nancy, okay. I yes. did reach out to Amanda oh, you because did. we were going back and forth about this particular um, item. Mm -hmm. um, and so she felt that she could help okay. with the presiding officer. Sure. But if Jen is willing no, to do it, it's I totally that's fine. Amanda, <laughs> that's, if you've yeah. spoken about as it, as long as somebody is willing it. to do it, yeah. that's fine. So, and okay. then um, I will join um, hopefully by 11.30, but certainly by 12, if not. Um, so, okay. and then after that, we have our meet regular meeting on the 18th and then on the 15th. So thank you all and have a good night. All right. Thank, thank, you. thank, you. thank you so much, Nancy.